recently you did something that I have never seen anyone do on Upwork. You raised your rate up to $999 an hour and actually got a client fairly quickly, job offer in your inbox, official acceptance of the offer, you got a $999 an hour client. Not one job that you did for $999 and happened to complete it in an hour. No BS, no, like, right? Cause like, we see this all the time, right? Like some new blogger will come on the scene and be like, oh, um, I, I made $200 an hour on Upwork. And then we look up their profile and it's like, they have a job for $200 and it's like, they just happen to complete it in an hour, maybe, but it's a fixed price job. This is like legit, Okay, I charge $1,000 per hour and the client's like, and we'll talk about the details, but the client's like, okay, right? That happened. And we need to talk a lot about this because as we discussed in your earlier segment, a couple of years ago, you started out at $25 an hour. So like, first of all, how, like what made you even start, when did you start thinking about like I could charge someday a thousand dollars an hour. Well, unfortunately, I can't charge a thousand because Upwork caps it at nine ninety nine. Oh my gosh! That's um, <laughs> otherwise, it would be a thousand because nine ninety nine is kind of embarrassing. You poor thing! Um, I'll give you an, I'll give you the other dollar. I'll kick that dollar in so you can feel good. But uh, yeah, you know, it it started. So I, I had gotten to a hundred dollars an hour, but that. Maybe just because I've been in the course and everything, that felt like, okay, that's in the realm of possibilities and everything. Sure. Um, it, it was really when you got your first job at 250 an hour on Upwork. I remember and, that. Um, like I was, I thought I was pushing the boundaries at that time. And you were. And you I was the at that time. Yeah. And I was like, wow, no one had ever charged and gotten that high to my knowledge. And, um, but then you got it. So it's like, if you can do it, why can't I do it? And you, you actually had at that point, a lot more like knowledge than I did in terms of the breadth of things you could do, because you'd work with clients on SEO, you'd work with clients on marketing strategy, you'd work with clients on their, like all this stuff that like, I didn't want to deal with any of that crap. Right. So I just stuck with writing. So that's what I knew. I knew a little bit about marketing strategy, but mainly Writer, you, you pay Danny to write stuff for you. In my mind, it's the reverse. It's like, you actually do the writing. I hate writing and I don't want to do the writing. But to me, like... This is know. the grass is greener. Everyone always, right? Everyone always thinks like, oh, if I was only him, I could... Okay, so, fine. Okay, so either way it is, you were like, I want to one-up this guy, right? And we have a little competition going, which I was thrilled to lose <laughs> because you were a student of my course. You were... Uh, a freelancer working for freelance to win at that time. And so I was like, win, please, right? And then, you know, go for it, beat me, right? And you did by one cent. Yeah, I charged $250 an hour and one cent. So it was like, okay, so this, whatever poor client you sent a price of $250 and one cent to, did they say anything about the one cent? Did they ask why? I think I felt self conscious and I said something about it. Did you but... say, I put this here? to uh, piss off one of my other uh, clients slash friends who's charging a penny less than this? Was that your answer? No. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, looking back, like if I were to do it today, I wouldn't have any problem doing that. Uh, but uh, yeah, honestly, I don't think they gave any, like they didn't care. They didn't care. At all, yeah. All right, so you got the job at $250 in one set. And this kind of like, moves you into a new mental stratosphere, right? I think where you really started thinking about these much, much bigger rates, right? Yeah. And, and so what, like, what is, what, what was that like for you? Like, were you worried about, did you have that same old anxiety come along with the $250 an hour job and, and, and did that subside at some point? Yeah. So, uh, at this point I no longer had so much insecurity about my skill, uh, my skills. I, I felt very confident I could get results for clients and do the work. Uh, I had done a lot of reading, I had done a lot of doing, um, so that wasn't the worry. It really was just a worry about the sales. 
Like, even with all the skills in the world, uh, you know, I see people with like 20 years of experience who can't get jobs at like $20 an hour and off work and they complain about it. So it's loudly, like, <laughs> very loudly. So, and then you're like, I, wa- I wonder why nobody wants to hire you. Yeah. Cause you got a shit attitude and you're an asshole. Okay. So I was worried about the sales. Are my sales abilities, uh, you know, up to par? Um, and, uh, Turns out they were, I guess. <laughs> do you think it's about selling or do you think it's about, you know, you're a good guy and you're smart, you want to help people win, and so it just kind of sells itself? Yeah, definitely. Um, I say sales because I don't have a better word for it. Yeah. But um, sales. the process of getting them to agree to work with me. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's scarier to do that at 250 than when I was at 25. So if your kind of journey from, like tell me if this is a fair thing to say. So can we say that your journey of going from like entry level, $25 an hour-ish area to, you know, $100, $150 an hour area, that was about getting confident with your skills, learning things and feeling like you could actually apply them. Yeah. And then moving into like this stratosphere pricing of multiple hundreds of dollars per hour and all the way up to 1000 minus a dollar per hour is really more about your, uh, your, your persuasiveness or your confidence in your own persuasiveness, feeling like you are polished or whatever. Yeah. Uh, feeling like, right. Cause I, th- I think when a lot of us think about that thousand dollar an hour person, we think about like shiny shoes we think about like the perfect haircut we think about like all these kind of slick lawyer type of things what i thought about was people who have a blog with fifty thousand people on their email list people who give talks at conferences uh people with large followings and you know best-selling books and so it like that's what i was looking at of the people whose blogs i read to learn marketing and stuff and said okay they can charge that much I'm not going to spend years building up an audience, making a fancy site, putting out, you know, thought leadership and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, I feel like that's like a, a new type of shiny shoes, so to say. Well, as, we, as you and I have talked about many times, like you, you went to a high school for like smart kids, right? You went to Stuyvesant mm-hmm. in New York. I had friends who went there. I did not go there. I went to a regular dumb public school. <laughs> But I knew kids in that school. It was a lot of smart, a lot of brain power in that school. Uh, and you were kind of the slacker of that school, right? Yeah. And so, like, your whole game has always been, like, you, you, you're, you like, the lazy smart kid, right? You're, like, always looking for the... You're, like, ambitiously lazy, I would say. Sort of. There, there is such a thing as smart lazy, but smart lazy is the kids who never study and still get hundreds. Okay, yeah. I was the kid who didn't study and I got literal like 65s on there. Right, so you're lo- you're always looking for like, what do I have, what's the least that I can do to get the goal? So your goal was like, I just want to pass and you're, you're going to figure out the easiest way to do that, right? Yeah. So you're always, you're, the, the byproduct of that, here's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not saying this to insult you, right? The, I'm saying this as, as a, a form of admiration because the byproduct of that is you're always finding ways to do things that are much easier than what many other people have considered. So while a lot of people are sitting there going like, ah, to get to $300,000, $500,000 an hour, I need an email list, I need a blog, I need thought leadership, I need to go to conferences. And that's fine. That's one way to do it, uh, right? I I later built up a blog, and it was a lot of work. And and I would never have done what I did for freelance to win for my freelancing business. Like I'm I'm with you. I don't see the purpose. Uh, it, it doesn't feel worth it to me to start a blog, work on it for like a year, and then maybe get some freelancing clients. Although we do know that there are people who take that route, and that's a fine route to take. Um, but in your case, you did it in just a much easier way. Yeah. So what were some of the surprise? Like, obviously, it was a surprise to you to find out that, oh, wait a minute, I can't charge a boatload of money without all these bells and whistles. Yeah. Was, um, it, was it a relief, by the way, to think, like, I, did, I didn't have to build a blog. I didn't have to do all this stuff. 
it was never, I never even considered that I would ever do that. It wasn't something like I, I was, okay, time to do the blog. Oh, thank God I don't have to do that now. It was more like, that's impossible and I'm not thinking about it. And now it's like, oh, interesting. Now I can. Why do you think it's so entrenched in people's minds that like, oh, if you want to get a really high hourly rate, you need to start a blog and get an email list. And because like, it's bloggers saying that and they're only able to talk about what they've done. Do, do clients even want to be on your email list? Like... No. Like, I don't email my clients like, oh, here's my weekly new, like my freelancing client. They don't get like, oh, here's my weekly update. Like, they don't care. They just have a page they want written and then they call me. Yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, yeah, if, if you did a blog and you were successful with it, you will blog about it. And if you look up blog posts about how to charge more, you're going to find them and it's kind of selection bias or whatever. Um, but, uh... It's like a circular reasoning, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, I have a blog, so therefore, the way to be successful is to get a blog. Right. What those people forget is that they got all their first clients in a totally different way in yeah. most cases. And I'm not gonna start freelance to win com right now <laughs> and start vlogging the opposite version. The so. one penny more. Freelance to win plus <laughs> a penny. Yeah. So... You get this job at $250 an hour and one penny, it goes well? Uh, yeah, so the client liked the work, I ended up um, you know, hiring other people to help do the job. Uh, Sp can, you, can we talk specifics on that? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's something that's important for people, not that they have to do that. I, uh, I don't think anyone needs to hire others. Yeah. But it, it's a great it's a great option to always have on the table if you want to grow. Right. So what'd you do? Like how'd that go? So in this case, the client wanted me to hire other people. That was part of the job. Was it their idea? They said, yeah. So they want an SEO done and they said, okay, uh, we'll pay your fee. Also, what kind of budget do you need to hire other people? <laughs> and uh, what type of people should we hire? And I was like, oh, okay. So and you've so, never been asked anything like that before, have you? Actually, I have. Oh, okay. In my hundred dollar an hour, in a previous job at hundred dollars an hour, the client also asked me. Uh, awesome. You know, there were some things they could do, um, and they said, "Okay, will you just tell us what to do, and our in-house team will do this?" And there were some things I suggested. They said, uh, "Okay, we can't do that. Can you suggest somebody?" And then I said, "Sure. Uh, you know, do you want to?" Uh, how do I give you the options and whatever? Do you want to get on a call with them? And he was like, eh, I don't really want to deal with that. So why don't you just hire them and then charge a little extra and I'll just keep paying you. So that this is your, was that your first inkling to where like, yeah. oh, okay, I see like higher level clients, they really just don't want to have to deal with this right. stuff. So there's another service that you can offer them is to just be essentially a project manager. Yeah, so I, I think... Some people think of, you know, hiring other people to do work with you is kind of like, oh, I'm going to sneak one over on the client and, you know, uh, hire this cheaper guy to do my work for me. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, when you do higher level work, there's a lot of clients who, you know, they want one point of contact. If they hire you for something like strategy, especially, they want you to deal with that stuff. They're not the expert in whatever they're hiring you for, so they trust you to know what to look for in a hire. And then they also want you to manage that budget and figure out, you know, okay, is hiring a person to do X, Y, Z at, you know, $50 an hour, good bang for my buck, or should I be looking at 20 an hour people? Should I be going up to $100 an hour people? And uh, for that job, I hired, uh, I ended up hiring three different people from, you know, as low as 50 an hour to as high as... 150 an hour and it, it's forcing you to be smart with the client's budget because you tell them how much you need up front and then you have to figure out how to make that work you can't just squander the whole budget and just come back and be like we don't have anything to show for it right so you got to be very careful you're learning a new skill now which is managing a project managing a budget uh albeit at relatively small stakes right like the client's not giving you a fifty thousand dollar budget right it's relatively small yeah. and so you can kind of play around and and start to it's basically the beginning of it's really a small 
almost a, an agency model that you're building at that point. Yeah. Uh, and probably that agency disbands at the end of that, right? So it's not like you're not hiring people long term. You're saying yeah. we've got this, you know, defined project that we're going to do. Here's how much you're going to get paid. And it's more billable hours for you right. because now you get to manage the project. So you get to, you're kind of like the orchestra, orca, orchestrator, maestro, or whatever you call it, <laughs> conductor, that's it. Um, and you're basically calling the shots and getting paid to manage the project and see it through to completion. Right. And so how did you find that experience? Like, did you like it? Um, yeah, I liked it a lot. And that's something I ended up doing for almost every project afterward. Uh, whether, you know, just referring people or bringing in more people. Um, in the hiring process, then I didn't have anything sophisticated. I just grabbed people off our, out of our courses. So the first hundred dollar an hour job, I got my sister to do some design stuff. Awesome. She's a designer. And then I hired Charmaine, who we have another interview with, to do some copy. And then this 250 job, um, I hired Daniel, who we're going to have another interview with. And uh, I just got him because we did a case study on him. Just people you knew from yeah. from your little little network that you built. Right. Like, so it's not like oh, me and Daniel are childhood friends, and I've worked with him forever. I just knew he was good. I saw other clients like his stuff, and um, so you know I just trusted his skills, and uh, they paid him 150 an hour to write copy. So that was uh, that was cool to work with him. Amazing. And, and if you hadn't had those people as resources, if they were busy, if you didn't have any network at all, you could just have easily, just as easily have gone on top or find people with some good And, and I did do that. You did so that as well. They also needed, uh, some other people. So I just, uh, you know, did a search on Upwork and I found, uh, I found two, two good people, uh, that were around like 40 to 50 an hour. And then I showed them at that time, I like showed them to the client, and I was like, "Which one do you like?" And I thought, "Oh, I'm giving you options," and they're like, "Dude, you pick." Yeah, and I was like, "Okay." So isn't that amazing? Film. I really want people to understand this, right? It's like the mentality of those higher level clients. Right. They are hiring you for your expertise, and yeah, like, and I get it. I've done that too, where it's like, "Oh, you know, here's like a, a bunch of different uh, options for the intro copy." And like, which one do you like better? And like, there's a time and place for that. You know, in some cases you might send them a little snippet. I call this green light method. And, uh, you know, there's, in some cases you might give them a little preview of what you're doing just to make sure they're on the same page. But in most cases it's like, Hey, we like you. We trust you. Just, just figure it out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you learned a lesson there. <laughs> Definitely. And, uh, you know, for that job, I, I hired both of them and I made them do a test project. I hired like five people to do a test project just because I was small like project. so scared. Yeah, very small. Like yeah. uh, whatever their hourly rate was for one hour. And so you were you were worried, like you just want to make sure you chose the right. You'd rather spend a little extra up front, but make yeah, sure you chose the right Yeah, and since it was person. part of the job, like I just expensed that and the client was totally fine and they like got that. So then I was, you know, able to choose more confidently which one I recommend and uh yeah, they were, they were very happy with me. And so what you're finding here too is like another thing that we found, you and I have learned this years and years ago, is that good clients are not nickel and diming, right? right? They're just, they're, they're willing to invest money in their business. They just want somebody who, and I always go back to this, right? Somebody who can get the job done, somebody who is going to make their life easier, and somebody who cares about helping them actually win, not just trying to make money. And so once you do those three things, well, you find that it goes really well. So you hire a bunch of people, you put this project together and what happened? Were there, do you like, were there any stumbling blocks? Did anything surprise you? The job was going really well. And then out of the blue, there was no job. So, uh, the client, there were startups, startups are startups. And, uh, one day, you know, uh, one of the people were like, uh, yeah, we can't, uh, afford to keep doing this. Um, thanks for the work we've done so far. And, uh, they, they, uh, you know, took the work I did. I outlined trashy stuff. They like paid me for an extra hour to like wrap up loose ends. And, uh, yeah, so I don't really have like measured results or anything from that, but they were happy with the work that I did. And, uh, hopefully they went on to use it 
um, and uh, you know made back that investment. But um, you know that's another thing I learned. You know they're a business, and they're looking at it a different way. Um, so you know they they invested in building out one part of their business uh, with me, and um, you know they didn't see it as like oh I personally you know handed over all these you know bills to you out of my wallet. Uh, and now the project is over, so give it back. Like, right, they can, they can just, they can kill a project, you know. Right. We've killed projects at Freelance to Win, right? We've invested money and time and resources and, oh, let's build this product, and then at some point we just go, you know, this isn't working out, let's just kill the project, you know. Yeah. Um, and some freelancers work in a kill fee, you know. Yeah. Some, yeah, they will. They'll say, like, they'll put it in their, in, you know, in their, uh, in their contract. Yeah, and it's it can be as simple as like even just on in the Upwork like chat room before you accept the project, you say, "Oh, by the way, Mr. Client, uh, if you end up like l let's say you're getting fifty percent upfront and fifty percent of your fee when the project is done." So you might say like, "Okay, I'm getting fifty percent upfront." That, that and by the way, there's a million different ways to do this. I'm not like recommending like one specific way, but I'm just trying to show people how to think about this. So you might say, "Okay, I'm getting fifty percent of my fee upfront. That's going to be non-refundable." Um, if you end up killing the project before I get the remainder of my fee, I still am entitled to 50% of the remainder or something like that. Like I said, there's an infinite number of ways to, yeah, structure it. Yeah, they call it a kill fee. Or you might say like, uh, I get 100% of my fee uh, when the project is done, but if you kill the project in the middle, I still get half the fee. So kill fee, you know, protects you somewhat from that. Um, but uh, either way, wasn't that smart. <laughs> yeah, no, that, and that's that's totally cool. Um, but I mean, my point is, yeah, they're not going to look at it like, oh, the project only got done halfway, so you didn't do anything. They were still happy. And by the way, startups are tough. You know, I've learned this too. Like when you're dealing with startups, sometimes you deal with a startup that's like really well funded and they have a lot of money, and and in many cases, you know, happy to burn some of it. They even call it a burn. <laughs> I love that term, right? Burn rate. That's how much a startup is spending. Usually the month. ones with the big budgets there that are, you know, throwing it around and doing 500 projects at once, they're the ones that have the most risk. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because there's also cool to be a part of them. Yeah, exactly. Right. So just like anything else, you know, there's like risk and reward. So what happened after, what was your next step? Are you sort of thinking about like jumping up in price again now? So, um... You know, one thing that has always been very important to me is that I'm authentic with my rate. Uh, there's a lot of people who, you know, I, I've seen the blog post where they suggest like, oh, whatever your real rate is, jack it up a bunch so you can negotiate back down. And I think that's kind of easy. Yeah. yeah. So whatever I set my rate to, I only do it if... I 100% would not take a dollar less. So, you know, if that client had come back and said like, hey, could you do 250 and we'll just knock off the penny? I would have said, fuck no, I'll just wait for the next one who will take the penny, you know? And uh, that, um, you know, it is something, that's my one unbreakable rule. I know that there are times when, uh, you know, you want to get projects and so you might come down and get a consolation prize or something. But for me personally, uh, I never planned for that. And um, a, a part of it is because it's like really stressful for me to do the jobs and uh, I'll end up doing a lot of research and, you know, stay awake at night thinking about this stuff. So it's like, I already have stable clients and full-time work. So for me to do extra beyond that, uh, you know, I'm not going to haggle over that because it's, Extra work. You feel like you're providing a very valuable service, you're giving it your all, and why shouldn't you get every penny that you're asking for? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, usually, so I have, you know, stable clients giving me full-time work, and if I don't jack up my rate, uh, I'm going to end up just turning down other people, because I'd rather work with the ones that are working with me you know, full-time and I have a history with and I like and I know their business and I'm already providing value. Uh, so why knock one of those off to work with someone new for the same price? Doesn't make so any sense. You, or just work yourself harder. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, usually sometime after the job, 
after I get, and it's the same pattern, right? I'll get a flood of invites, it'll be at the same price, I'll keep projecting them all, and then at some point it's like, I'm just gonna throw an extra 100 to my rate. And so after the 250 job, like why, 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 like, why throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Yeah. Like you're rejecting all these. Why not like, hey, let me just see if one of these people is willing to pay drastically more. Right. Yeah. So I, I raised my rate to 350 after that. After, you know, sometime after the 350 job, I raised it to 450. After that, 550. And uh, after that, I, I got a little worried. So instead of, you know, 650, I did 598. I think a lot of people would have been worried about... The situation after the two hundred and fifty dollar an hour startup job got killed. Right. I think a lot of people. Tell me if you agree with this. I feel like a lot of people would have gotten demoralized in your position, where they would have been like, oh, you know, I tried to charge two hundred fifty bucks an hour and one penny, and it, it kind of worked, but then they they ended up not being able to afford the project after all. Like I knew this wasn't going to work. Like I knew I wasn't going to be able to sustainably charge that amount. You know what I mean? And so how did you deal with that? Or did that even occur to you? So because I had stable work, even if it failed, I would have been okay. Steady work at like a hundred plus dollars per hour. Yeah. I don't think you should, uh, like I never would have put myself in a position where I needed that 250 an hour work to like eat and pay rent. When you, so in other words, what you're saying is when you're stretching your rate, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're counting on that. Yeah. So financially, Losing that job was like, oh well. Right. Because um, it was just gravy for you at that was, time. Yeah, it was purely gravy. Yeah. And, you know, losing it was kind of like, whatever. But once you get into a realm where you can charge multiple clients that same amount, right. now that becomes your new benchmark. Yeah. Like right now, you're never going to go back to $150 an hour or $100 an hour right. because you've proven that you can sustainably get work at much, much higher rates. Yeah, so you know, after getting that first two fifty an hour job, uh, you know, off Upwork, if people you know asked me for help, and you know, I had gone to some conferences, not really trying to market myself for anything, but like just making friends and people who ask if I can do something. Then I just give them my new high rate, and after uh, you know having that one job on Upwork at two fifty and a cent, uh, that just became new rate. For new people and uh, having that it built up the confidence to where I said you know what the new stretch rate has to be above 250 because 250 is old stuff now and also even if the job wasn't like necessarily you know completed or anything uh, it wasn't a fixed price job it was an hourly, hourly job they were paying me for my advice at the time paying me to do uh, you know a service that I did do at every point and um, so I got paid for the work I did and I know it was good work so it not working out for them it, it doesn't have to be because I failed maybe they mismanaged something else or something else went wrong or one of their investors pulled out or something and I, I just learned to like you know understand that wasn't a hundred percent related to me or even at all related to me. It's a great, great way to look at it. So what's so you bounced back quickly because of all the reasons you just mentioned, and then what what was your next move? So my next move was I raised my rate to three fifty, and I very quickly got a job at that rate. Were you surprised again? Like, wow, I keep raising my rate and like I keep landing clients. You know, at, at that point. No, to be honest. Awesome. Because breaking past 250, it's like, you know, I realize there's no ceiling. Well, now I realize there's a ceiling. A thousand is the ceiling. For now. For now. For now. For now. <laughs> but, for, and that's for hour only. For hour only. So you yeah. can still charge $2,000 an hour and just build them as a, right. just send them invoices on a course. course. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I realized there was no ceiling. So, if you can go from 100 to 250, then 250 to 350 is actually a smaller jump, you know? Uh, you're only jumping 100 rather than 150. That's right. So, uh, That's right. These are the counterintuitive little mental things that most people don't realize. Right. They just start... I remember years ago when I first started on Upwork. Actually, I mean, this is like probably my second year on Upwork. I was really starting to uh, hit, hit my stride, right? 
And I, I was reading, I'd read these chats online, like on LinkedIn, these like chat room, um, you know, boards or whatever, forums and, uh, or groups, Facebook, you name it. And people are always just like, they would come along and they'd be like, yeah, um, I did a statistical calculation and, uh, you know, here's my gorilla math that I used and blah, blah, blah. And it turns out you can't make more than about $35,000 a year on Upwork. And I'm like, it's like April and I've already made more than that. Like, what are you talking, like already made more than that this year. Like you're, you're wrong. And they'd be like, dude, my math, look, this is my statistical calculate. And I'd be like, this is the money I've made. Look, like, you know, it's like one of these situations where like, who are you going to believe me or your own eyes, you know? And it's like, once you get out of that, like, I don't, you call it whatever you want, like scarcity mentality. It's always an arbitrary number. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Where it's like, oh, a uh, hundred dollars an hour, but you're not going to be able to charge you more than that. Like, really? What? Like, why? Like, do you think the client is sitting there and that's just like some magical number? Like, did the government tell them they can't spend any more than that? Right. So you, you break out of this now and you're sort yeah. of like Neo in the matrix now where it's like, <laughs> Right. And you're like, okay, I can do more. So tell me what's, what's that look like? So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, it was a real rate to me. I only raised it to 350 when I knew I would reject more 250 work. And, um, so when I got the job at 350, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm so surprised. Uh, that would come back later on at a certain point. But, um, at the time I was very, very confident in my skills. I had done a lot to go from where I was in the beginning, where I was kind of just bumbling around, looking at blog posts. Now I was at a point where I was very, very confident. I knew that I had knowledge that even a lot of pros didn't have. Any examples? Um, I don't want to go into like marketing nitty gritty. I could talk about that for like 10 hours. We'll do another interview one day. Okay, but how about just, about one, just one example of something that you, you know, what does that look like when, when you know something and you feel like... You know, if we put 10 professionals together in a room, I'd probably be the only one who knows this. So, okay, I, I can give an SEO example and a non-SEO example. So cool. uh, SEO ended up being um, what I specialize in, and that's what I do mainly now. And uh, so for SEO, a lot of people are very focused on um, keywords, and then there's a level above that where they realize like, oh, there's this thing, latent semantic indexing, where specific keywords don't matter. And um, when I had gotten beyond LSI, latent semantic indexing stuff, where it became even less about keywords to do optimizations, and I started using knowledge of stuff I had read about uh, UI, UX, and just web design in general, and I had taught myself how to do technical stuff too. Um, you know, I had a client where I didn't write a single word for them, uh, but I doubled their organic traffic just by, uh, you know, increasing what they call engagement metrics entirely through just the site design. And that let them get more traffic from Google, but also it actually improved their sales and, uh, you know, their conversion rate for people going through the site because that actually... You know, when you make those kinds of optimizations, it's stuff people see. Whereas, you know, if you do like, you know, if you purchase backlinks, rent backlinks from some private blog network or something, like, yeah, that may get you more traffic technically, but it's not going to improve anything once people land on the site. Yeah, like this, you know what this totally reminds me of? I've been doing this ketogenic diet recently. And so if you go online and you're looking up like, uh, you know, how, how to do this diet, it's like, okay, you want to prick your finger, check your blood. So after a few days on the diet, check your blood for these ketone, what they call these ketone yeah. bodies, right? And everyone's like, oh yeah, I got tons of ketones, tons of ketones. And then it's like, oh yeah, I bought a bottle of exogenous ketones and I drank it and now I have this huge amount of ketones. And like, and then, and then you got all these like actual like smart people being like, oh my God, what are you guys doing? Like the point of this is not to get the most ketones. The point is to get a lean body, build some muscle. So they're kind of focused on the wrong thing, right? It's like, oh, look at all these links I got you. The point is not to get links. The point is to actually get results right. for the business. So uh, this 350 job, um, that wasn't an SEO job. That was a, uh, they wanted mainly, um, well, it was partly SEO. It's partly SEO. They partly wanted PPC, which is when you do paid ads. Pay-per-click. And yeah. 
Um, usually that means Google AdWords. Uh, but you know, I also got certified in Bing ads. And for the industry that this client was in, I knew that they could get cheaper ads doing it on Bing, and a lot of their audience was still there because it's still a default search engine. Um, so they had kind of like maxed out what they were doing, um, you know, with Google AdWords in a way. And so having that knowledge and being able to you know, advise them on that allowed them to do more. Uh, and, you know, so I, I was very confident in what I could do for them and, and other clients at that price. So, you know, for me, it wasn't fear of, uh, it wasn't fear of, can I do the job anymore? It was more fear of, can I do that sales stuff, but not just, can I win the job? Also, can I set their expectations right? Um, can I make them excited about it? Can I make them uh, want to do repeat work? And so that's where my focus was at that point. Not so much on the skills, but on the freelancing end of it. And at that time, like you, you still didn't have a website, right? Like yeah. everyone always says like, oh, you need a website, right? So I had worse. <laughs> so, um, had no website. Worse than no website. <laughs> yeah, worse than no website. I had actually like negative properties. Uh, so no website. Tell people what negative properties means. So like, if you have a website, uh, you know, that's good, it's positive. If you have no website, that's neutral. If you have a website that says, you know, fuck your mother, that's negative. So, uh, or like coming in, coming in, coming soon in 2014 and it's now 2016. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I didn't have like a terrible website. What I had was I had a very unprofessional email address. That's like, like you can't get Stephen Young at gmail.com or Stephen A. Young or anything. So I have like, you know, like a bunch of initials and then my birth year, which shows that I'm only 24. Uh, and then... Uh, when I so when I needed to get like access to their Google Analytics or something or to, just to talk with them, I have to like give them that email, and I, it it did bother me because I'm like shit, this is a bad email to give them. But then like I got very entrepreneurial about like a business name. I was like, ah, oh, I need the perfect business name, and it's like, man, I haven't responded to this guy. He's asking for my email so he can start this project. It's been three days. I think I just got to give it to him. And like every single job, I would have that same thing where I spend like you know, multiple days looking at available domain names, like yeah. finding nothing and being like, oh, let me just, I'll do it this time, but next job. And, uh, then worse for like Skype, if I had to do Skype and do screen shares, I don't have a professional Skype either. Cause I can't get like a good version of my name. <sighs> the only Skype I have is like my gaming tag. <sighs> So, you know, I'd be charging very high amounts of money for high level marketing consultation and I'd give them the same name I use for online gaming and stuff. So, uh, you know, can't be less professional than that. But I found out they don't care. Nobody ever asked for a website. Nobody ever asked for, you know, a fancy, you know, portfolio to be mailed to them. No one ever even questioned my email. Even, you know, clients who were paying me hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So I kind of just got over it. And it's like, it's funny because you're doing like website consulting for people. Like you're yeah. consulting them on their own website. I think most of us, myself included, back in the day, I, I started feeling very uh, self-conscious about like, you know, I'm talking to people about their web copy. And then this one lady asked me one time, she's like, She's like, you know, what do you think I should do with my web? Like, I'm trying to, you know, woo this, new, you know, p potential client. And she's like, what do you think I should do with my website? And I'm like, uh, you know, I think you should write this kind of copy and that kind of copy. And she's like, do you have a website? And I'm like, no. And she's like, basically like, click. And, uh, and so that, that night I had to get a website because I felt like <laughs> such an, but here you are, no website still this whole time, negative web properties as you're calling it. Like, did you have a LinkedIn profile at least? There's nothing I can put on LinkedIn. I don't have a college degree even. So like, yeah, it's so, barren and empty. And so nothing. You have nothing. And so, but it, it didn't matter. You found out. Yeah, the, no one ever looked for it. The only time anyone asked for my LinkedIn was clients saying like, "Hey, can I give you a LinkedIn recommendation?" Like, there's <laughs> too many Stephen Youngs on LinkedIn. Which one are you? Wow. It's like, mm, don't look for it. 
but uh, yeah, they don't care. So you, you never did anything with this until recently, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get to where this changed. <laughs> I think it's going to surprise me. So 350 an hour. And from there, you just keep going up right. until we hit this crazy mark. Like when did the number 999, like when did that start rattling around inside your head? I had won jobs at, I, the highest I had won before that was 598. And you know, that's when I got scared. I was like, do I go from 550 to 650? Like maybe I'll just keep it under the 600 mark. And I got like a little self-conscious for a second. Right. And, um, and it's not like every job I've ever done was like a breakout success. I've experimented a lot, uh, with the services I offer and trying to branch into new areas. And sometimes I've had clients feel like, yeah, it didn't really do it for me. And it's like, I gave it my best shot. And any examples of that, of like what you would consider, cause I've had that too. You know, I've talked about it publicly many times, the failure. Yeah, you know, or... Sometimes you charge a really high rate and people expect, uh, miracles and probably my biggest mistake was not turning down some of those jobs um i was very good at it at lower amounts where it's like jobs at 350 i'll turn down if they're not right um and then but if you only do like the one job you know how to do you never really grow either so uh you know sometimes i'll experiment i'll take something a little bit out of the comfort zone but I'll supplement that by doing, you know, a shit ton of research and making sure I can leverage the stuff that I do know. It's not like I'm going to go from doing SEO to doing graphic design when I've never touched Illustrator. One like thing that. I've done too is if it's a repeat client and you're in an, uh, an unknown area, you can tell them. Uh, you know, you can say like, hey, Mr. Client, and just full disclosure, I've never done this before, but I'm happy to, you know, try it out for you. And, you know, here's my plan. And a lot of times they'll be very amenable to that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, once you get into those higher, uh, budgets, it's true a lot. I mean, clients at low, uh, amounts like $50 an hour, $40 an hour, $20 an hour clients, sometimes they expect miracles too, but it does hit a little harder, uh, when, when you collide with one of those clients at a higher rate, because it's like, oh, I paid you hundreds of dollars per hour. Why? Like, so for SEO, it's like, why am I not on the front page of Google? And it's yeah. like, well, A, it takes time. B, it takes money. C, there could be a hundred other reasons that have nothing to do with you. Or for me as a copywriter, it's, uh, oh, so what kind of conversions are we going to get on this sales page? And it's yeah. like, uh, I, you know, I don't know, right? Like I'm not a psychic, right? So, so do you have any specific stories? Yeah. So, um, you know, especially when I did stuff like marketing strategy, you know, something that you've taught is, uh, you know, do a small job before you do a big job. And so if, if I know it's kind of experimental and it's a little iffy and the client knows it's iffy, rather than saying like, uh, please prepay for 30 hours up front, um, I'll say, you know, uh, let's just try it out at like two hours here. Yeah. See where it goes. Yeah. And the purpose of that is so that if it does fail, the client is not, you know, raging mad and it's a relatively small investment to make. Um, and you know, so I, I've had it where we do that test and it isn't as magical as they hope, uh, or I run as I'm doing the work, I run into more challenges and sometimes it's something that maybe I'm able to do, but not within budget. I find out. Mm. So I may find out like, Oh, I checked out the backside of your site and you just need to redo the whole thing. So, mm. uh, you know, and they'll say, Especially I don't have budget. Yeah, so you get kind of get under the hood of the car and realize, okay, this is not what I thought it was. Yeah. You let them know and kind of part ways as friends, even right. though they're not maybe thrilled, but that's life and it was a small amount they invested. Yeah, I've never had to do like a complete 100% refund or anything. Um, usually clients are very understanding as long as you make it clear like, hey, let's lower your risk right now. And they're very appreciative of that and they'll only do it if they're willing to. So you, you, you had some quote unquote failures, but they were small and you kept them protected. I mean, this is the way successful investors operate, right? Is their losses are, they're always going to have them, but they're going to be very small and their wins are going to be big. So yeah, as long as you protect yourself, I always say, people say like, Danny, like I saw a $10,000 job on your upper uh, profile. Like, how did you get a, how do you get a $10,000 job on Upwork? And I'm like, the answer to that is you get a $200 job on Upwork. Yeah. That is what you do first. Never jump into these. You know, I, I love it when I hear these people say like, 
oh, you know, I'll teach you how to be a freelancer or a consultant. And um, you're never going to like wake up in the morning for a client who's paying you less than $10,000. And I'm like, good luck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's great. So you were, you were like totally protected and, and it worked out okay. And nobody, nobody hits it out of the park a hundred percent of the time. So I think that's an important thing for people to know. And especially with conversations like this where, you know, yeah, there's the fun parts where you're collecting all the cash, but then there's the other part too, that we want people to really be prepared for. So, um, okay. So when did, when did this, I think I asked this and then I lost track a little bit, but we were talking about when, when did the number of 999 start rattling around your head? Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is something that you had said all the time, you know, someone's willing to pay X, they're also willing to pay Y. There's certain numbers where yeah, it's like, with, with, certain, with yeah. certain numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would, um, you know, usually in terms of like, oh, I got this shit at Costco. It was way too cheap. Anyone who's going to buy this product, you know, it can pay five bucks more. And I started looking at, uh, you know, my rates sort of the same way. And it's like anybody who has $550 an hour to spend an extra, you know, 48 bucks on top of that is a drop in the bucket at that point. Probably not going to be the deal breaker. Yeah. This is why I laugh when people email me and they're like, oh, Dan, you know, in, uh, in the real world, like I charge $40 an hour to my real world clients, but on Upwork, I cap it at 30 because that's like upward clients want to spend. And I'm like, no, the upward client also lives in the real world. And $30 is still $30 and $40 is still $40. And the difference between those two is really very minimal. So you're discovering the same thing, but just at a higher yeah. caliber. And when you get really high, you know, it, it gets wider. So yeah. the difference between, you know, $1 an hour and $50 an hour is... $49 difference. Huge. But 550 to 598, it's like same difference. It's but still the same amount of money. Very small one way and ridiculous the other way. You know what this is like? This is like, uh, I, read, I read this one time in, in uh, I think in an economics book or, or something like that, where uh, people will drive like miles out of their way to save, let's say like $10 on gas. Okay. And it might even be like, it might even be fine. Like they, let's say they just, like they spend an extra like dollar in gas, but they save like $10, but they, you know, they kind of drive like halfway across town, whatever. But then when they're sitting in a car dealership and you tell them like, they're, they're about to like sign for like a $20,000 car. And you're like, you can save a hundred dollars if you drive to the town over. And they'd be like, ah, it's a hundred bucks or 50 or like maybe a hundred dollars might be like a cutoff point where it's like, but you tell them they can save like 10 or 20 bucks. It's the same $10 that they would drive across town to save on gas or like uh, uh, even like paper towels, right. right? But now it's just like, I'm, I'm spending 20 or 50 grand on a car. I'm not trying to save like 10 bucks by like going across town and like wasting all afternoon, right? So it's kind of the same. I think about that all the time. There was uh, like very recently, I wanted my brother to like buy a $20 game so we could play together. He's like, I'm not gonna spend $20 on that. You know, I, oh, that's so much. And I was like, dude, it's actually free, but, <laughs> your car repair that costed twenty dollars more. Right. That's all that's happening. And then right. I mean, he's like, oh okay, cool. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Wink wink. It's so and funny, then, right? Exactly. And people think like they think that clients are sitting like to bring this back to like the freelancer world, people think clients are sitting there like and we're clients. We spend lots of money on freelancers. And they think like that we're sitting there with this like spreadsheet and like right. that we have like this CFO and like a team of like statisticians be like this is the right price to pay. No bullshit. Like we sit there, we make a judgment call just like any other human being. And if you can make it seem favorable, we'll do it. And if you don't, then we won't. And that's why it's so important for me particularly that uh, I charge the absolute minimum I'm willing to take. And if they say like, oh, a dollar less, I, I have to refuse. And I only ever will refuse and I have refused many times I've had a I've had invites from people saying like hey you know I saw your rate at 598 ready to hire you $500 an hour mm. and it's like sorry no and I've even had clients who have been willing to pay like I had someone message me say hey I see your rate at 550 when it was 550 and we got on the call and, and, and everything and I asked him what he needed turns out he didn't really need me and it wouldn't have made sense and so I said, you know, hey, uh, I gave him some tips on the phone. I said, start with this, which you can do completely without me. 
Uh, and then if you need my help later, then you can call. And um, I, I've had that happen. I've had this one guy who like messaged me once and then, you know, over messaging, it was like not the right time. And then he came back later and my price was higher. He's like, I'm ready now. And then I, I still kind of like said, not yet. Uh, and I know he'll come back around too. Yeah, I've had the same thing happen to me many, many times where I'm not just trying to, because that's the flip side of if you want to charge a lot, great, you got to be someone of value. And if you're going to be someone of value, guess what? You have to be, again, wanting to help them win. And if you want to help them win, that means you help them win, even if it means helping them win by not working with you. And there may be a cheaper alternative out there. And I've had people say to me things like, Danny, you know, uh, I love your work, but it's very expensive. And I'll always say like, you know, I can recommend someone who's less expensive. I don't want, the last thing I want is a client who can't afford me stretching their budget and putting all of their hopes into me and really feeling uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And that's not what I want. That's like renting out a house to someone that they can't afford. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like just a matter of time before something goes wrong, right? You want clients who can afford you. And, and this, is, this is part of the responsibility. I want people to hear this, right? It's part of the responsibility that comes with charging hundreds of dollars per hour is that you need to tell clients when it's not a good fit. And I love that authenticity of being able to say, that's my price, not a dollar less. Because guess what? They walk away. They respect you. They know that you're somebody who's uh, got integrity, which is very rare these days. Your value goes up. And they do. They come back. Like, and not even like once in a while do they come back. They come back more often than, than people would realize. Yeah. They'll come back later. Uh, or, you know, or maybe maybe they didn't, they never did that well. You know, so like if they have like, like I've turned away startups. And I didn't think they were going to do well. And I said, like, I don't think it's a good fit. They went out of business. But other times, they'll surprise you. They'll come back and be like, we tripled our business and we'd love to hire you now.